As a reader of both comic books and general literature, I've always loved finding works of fiction that dive into a fascination with the new and amazing discoveries of the era that they were written in. Take for example Mary Shelley's interest in the new discoveries of biology while she wrote her most famous work, Frankenstein. As well as J. Michael Straczynski's wonder towards the quantum paradox of Schrodinger's cat in his chapter on Dr. Manhattan in Before Watchmen. This is how science fiction blossoms and grows, through a curiosity towards newborn subjects and a passion from brilliantly creative writers. But being both a math major and teacher, I found a very personal attachment to the work of comic book writer Grant Morrison in his run on the Vertigo slash DC character Animal Man. Like other excellent writers of science fiction, Morrison takes a fledgling subject of discovery and explores the thematic significance of the phenomenon. However, Morrison also garnishes it with a literary flair that transforms his story from that of science fiction to what I prefer to call science artistic fiction. He finds the art in the subject and attempts to present the same beauty in issue 6 of Animal Man, as he brings together three of my favorite things, obscure characters, fresh subjects of discovery, and captivating storytelling. The issue of Animal Man begins with a Thanagarian armada preparing to invade Earth. The Thanagarians are the same alien race as Hawkman and Hawkgirl, and their invasive approach towards Earth is coupled by a self-reflective narration from a specific Thanagarian by the name of Rikora So, a character of primary focus for the issue. We see that Rikora So is an artist of sorts, and plans on presenting his final artistic work in an act of martyrdom after having drank a lethal venom for reasons not fully explained yet. We see that Rikora So has prepared a bomb of sorts, and plans on using it as the first strike in a Thanagarian invasion. But after seeing the ship make its way towards Earth, Animal Man hastily confronts the artist and his armed bodyguard. After subduing the Thanagarian warrior, Animal Man is too exhausted to continue his fight, and so the artist Rikora So monologues his plan to the hero. Rikora explains that he is an artist of destructive caliber, and plans to initiate a seismic poem in the form of a calculated earthquake using a bomb that he had recorded his entire memory to in infinite detail. The bomb randomly shuffles through Rikoroso's memories and plans to detonate once it reaches his most emotional and impactful memory so as to explode in a blaze of glory. Rikoroso soon dies from his venom, and Animal Man scrambles to try and deactivate the explosive. But we, as the reader, get to watch as the bomb searches through the artist's memory. We find a memory of Rikoroso as a child in his most formative years, just as he is bearing witness to a decoratively complex fractal figure referred to as the Chirica set. Inspired and in awe of its infinite complexity, the young Rikoroso later grows up to be a traditional artist, and even manages to discover his own fractal image, calling it the finest, most powerful work I will ever produce. After spending hours in awe of his art, we learn that Rikoroso destroys the fractal figure, and this, being his most emotionally charged and impactful moment, detonates the bomb, until Hawkman arrives to disarm the explosive just in time. Now the fractal image that we see inspire Rikoroso to pursue a life of artistry and ultimately construct his fractal bomb is indeed a mathematical phenomenon. While we see that the Thanagarians call it the Chirica set, it is referred to in real life as the Mandelbrot set. Named after the modern father of fractal geometry, the Mandelbrot set has become a central icon of this subject of mathematics. But before we can discuss and really appreciate the significance and beauty behind the Mandelbrot set as Morrison writes in Rikora's character, we first need to talk about fractals in general, and Mandelbrot himself. The term fractal was coined by Mandelbrot in reference to the Latin root fractus, which is used to describe broken or fragmented things. However, fractal patterns have been present in people's imaginations 
long before Mandelbrot's arrival, which can be seen in the art of a wide variety of cultures, as well as through the thought experiments of various mathematicians. Fractals are most often defined as images or patterns that are self-similar, or possessing a scaled-down version of the whole within its parts. But this is in fact a very specific category of fractal geometry. One of the more general definitions of what fractals are is that they are images with infinite detail. And with this definition, most anything that is infinitely detailed, whether it be a physical shape or an abstract idea, can be considered fractal. Now the reason for this definition stems from the real-world foundations that fractal geometry was founded upon. To explain, let's compare fractal geometry to what most people consider to be regular geometry, Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry presents idealized shapes and figures, images that are simple and relatively easy to grasp, what with their uniform lines and smooth curves. Now fractal geometry very clearly stands starkly opposed to this idea. Where Euclidean geometry has been smooth and simple upon inspection, fractal geometry grows more rough and complex when one takes a closer look. The reason for this fundamental schism lies in the original utility of fractal geometry. As Mandelbrot elegantly puts it, clouds are not spheres, mountains are not cones, coastlines are not circles, and bark is not smooth, nor does lightning travel in a straight line. Curiously enough, this is a quote that writer Grant Morrison just so happens to paraphrase in the first page of the issue. Nevertheless, Mandelbrot's message is clear. Where Euclidean geometry fails to describe the nature of reality, fractal geometry comes in and accomplishes the task. Fractal geometry is the geometry of nature. This is what Mandelbrot established. But who is this Mandelbrot that we've been talking about so much? Well, born in Poland, raised in France, and blossomed in the United States, Benoit Mandelbrot was a 20th century polymath who is often regarded as the father of modern fractal geometry. Having an apprentice relationship with his mathematician uncle during his years in France, Mandelbrot grew up with a love for mathematics and a curiosity for the geometry of nature. In fact, his education in France was probably what molded Mandelbrot's character the most. As Mandelbrot grew, he desperately wanted to work towards a mathematics where artistic visualizations of abstract ideas were embraced wholeheartedly. Unfortunately for him, mathematics in France was mostly being governed and molded by a group of mathematicians going by the single name of Bourbaki, a sort of French Illuminati of mathematics that did all in their power to ensure that mathematics stayed strictly theoretical, abstract, and purely analytical. Seeking to escape the oppressive authority of this organization, Mandelbrot moved to the United States, where he was given the intellectual freedom and creativity to discover his most famous work, the Mandelbrot set. Now without getting too technical, the Mandelbrot set is much like any other set, a collection of numbers. But if it's a collection of numbers, then why is it portrayed as an image? Well, to answer the question, we need to refer to a very common diagram in mathematics, the xy plane. What's brilliant and revolutionary about this graphing plane is that it was an invention that essentially married the subjects of geometry and algebra together, and so abstract ideas like numbers and equations could be visually represented as geometric phenomena. The Mandelbrot set is an example of such a geometric phenomenon that takes place on a variant of the xy plane, the complex plane, also referred to some as the z plane. All of the points that are colored in black in these images are members of the Mandelbrot set. In fact, the entire Mandelbrot set, with all its infinite detail and complexity, is determined by a relatively simple function. Now, since Grant Morrison's story doesn't actually need much of an understanding of the analytical side of the Mandelbrot set to appreciate the themes he discusses, this is as far as we'll go mathematically. However, if you're really curious about the equations and algebra that goes into developing the Mandelbrot set, I've left some very helpful resources in the description below. 
Now there are a variety of reasons for why the Mandel Broad set matters so much. One of which being the fact that it just appears to be so paradoxical. It clearly has a limited area, but also has an unlimited perimeter. Another reason for its importance is that along the border of the set, we find a dense variety of fractals, and so the entirety of the Mandelbrot set is considered to be a catalog of an infinite number of fractals itself. The entire fractal is a collection of different fractals. That's honestly insane. But one of the philosophical reasons for why the Mandelbrot set matters so much is the fact that it was discovered by Benoit Mandelbrot, not invented. This means that it's generally regarded as evidence of mathematical realism. That is, the idea that mathematics as a phenomenon exists independently of consciousness. The presence of the Mandelbrot set shows that mathematics isn't just a collection of rules and ideas that people throughout history decided to make, but instead, it's proof that mathematics as a whole is truly real. And it's beautiful. If there was anything to take away from this cursory discussion of the Mandelbrot set, it's that at a variety of levels, the set possesses a surprisingly artistic quality in a subject that has a stigma for being inelegant and sterile. Now, given all this information, I believe it's very clear that Grant Morrison wishes to explore his fascination with fractal geometry in his issue of Animal Man. From glorifying the Mandelbrot set as an almost ethereal enigma, to proposing the notion that all of life is a fractal with its infinite details. But whether Grant Morrison had intended for this to be the case, the character of Recorso feels like a being who very much parallels Benoit Mandelbrot. The two grew up with an intrinsic fascination with fractal images, were rejected for their passions, and both ultimately discovered their own fractal sets that changed their lives. Grant Morrison also demonstrates a very overt fascination with the concept of infinity, and how such a boundlessness can in fact be captured within a single image through the art of fractal geometry. Where the character of Recorso manifests the questions and wonders that come from a very human curiosity towards the infinite and unreachable, Morrison also embeds within him a sort of solace that one can find in the face of such an overwhelming presence. In his first encounter with the Mandelbrot set, the young Recorso is in clear awe of the fractal image, and is frustrated by the fact that its infinitely intricate complexity will always be beyond his sight. But it's not fair. I want to see it. I want to see it all. Meanwhile, the adult and mature Recorso, we find just moments before his death, has grown to find peace with infinity. Oh father, I understand now. I have seen enough. He still managed to discover his very own fractal image, and we even realize that the record of his infinitely detailed life is its own fractal. Recorso, and most everyone else, has always known infinity. But despite all of this, I believe it's also easy to admit that this entire issue is incredibly vague and open to interpretation. It's very much like art and even the Mandelbrot set in that way. Morrison doesn't end the comic with any explicit takeaways like his previous issues on animal rights, but instead, we are very much like Recorso when he is gazing upon his fractal art, left alone to make our own meaning out of the work we've just witnessed. William Frucht, the man behind an entire anthology of several math-inspired works, sums up my thoughts much more eloquently than I could have expressed with this single quote. Using mathematics to tell stories, and using stories to tell mathematics, are two sides of the same coin. They join together what should have never have been separated. The scientists' and the artists' ways of uncovering truths about the world.